Northern Power Women podcast. For your career and your life, no matter what business you're in. Hello, happy June. I'm Sam Walker and welcome to episode 12 of the Northern Power Women podcast. Don't be afraid to be annoying. It might just get you what you want. This month, we spent time in Leeds. Well, Simone did. I didn't. More on that later. Uh, For our live podcast recording. And we talked about the fact that robots are coming, whether we like it or not. Uh, Whether employers need to take more of an active role in the mental good health of their staff. And we chatted about inspiring role models of the big and small screens. Dana Scully, anyone? Uh, not many films or TV shows about marketing, so it's a <laughs> lack of... But I, th- I think when I was about 10 years old, my favourite programme was a $6 million man. And, of course, today's price is probably about $37 million. It was all about Steve Austin, an astronaut, and he had bionic legs, bionic arm, bionic eyes. And it's like, this is a future. We can all be like that. In this month's interview, you'll hear from a woman who had to step away from the career that she'd spent nearly 30 years building in order to save her own life. The host of The Morning Programme on BBC Radio Leeds, the incredible Stephanie Hurst. I want to work in radio and I'm not stopping and I'm going to bug the living daylights out of these guys until they they let me in was was very much my ethos. (laughs) It's always been my ethos, really, I guess. And in Ask the Hive, you helped a very frustrated Ryan who can't get onto a graduate scheme despite trying everything. Go to meetups, there's loads of them around. These are brilliant for networking, you get to meet experts, you know, and you quite often find out about jobs. But whilst you've been working and hopefully playing hard in the sunshine of the last few weeks, one woman has not had time to stop and smell the roses. Let's catch up with her now, the founder of Northern Power Women, Simone Roche, for some Northern Power Women news. Today, I'm in the Northern Power Podcast Studios in Manchester with Sam Walker. We're celebrating our 12th episode and it's our one year anniversary. So we're having Yorkshire tea and Eccles cakes. What a great panel we had this month for the podcast. We recorded it over at the Leeds Digital Festival. So thank you, Sarah Tulip, Stuart Clark and Annie Mosquait for getting involved in this year's panel. It was an excellent festival. So don't miss out Leeds Digital Festival in future. This month we've launched our Power Circles with KPMG bringing together some brilliant female leaders and influencers from across the north. We've held one in Yorkshire, the Yorkshire Power Circle as it now is, and also in Manchester. So watch out next month where we're coming to Newcastle. We're really happy to be progressing our partnership with Manchester Airport, who've always agreed to support next year's Northern Power Women Awards. The fourth awards, I can't believe it. And we've also got some influencer forums coming soon, so watch this space. Whilst we're talking about the Northern Powerhouse and our influences, we're taking part in the Northern Powerhouse Summit, which is taking place in July at the Great Exhibition of the North. They're also looking for speakers and people to get involved, so please check out the website if you want to get involved. Northern Power Futures is also garnering a lot of support, and we hope to announce the dates for Manchester and Newcastle soon. Thank you all so much for the offers of support. We really appreciate them. And great news, our peer-to-peer mentoring is open again for October. Uh, So get involved, sign up, 12 months of mentoring plus 12 months of webinars and live events. So much to get involved with at Northern Power Women. Connect at northernpowerwomen.com or at North Power Women. And don't forget, leave us a review. Five stars would be great. Thank you and happy one year anniversary. Now, what Simone didn't mention there is we have some very exciting news on the way about a very special bonus podcast episode, plus a very special podcast series to inspire and delight you. More details to follow, so please watch this space. Now, to this month's discussion panel, and a massive apology from me. Thanks to the wonders of the Great Northern Motorway Network, I was crying in a five-mile tailback on the M62, while Simone took up the reins and did a sterling job at KPMG and the Leeds Digital Festival. They are noisy in Leeds today, so welcome. We are delighted to be here at KPMG, and we are also part of the Leeds Digital Festival. 
So we are delighted. Thank you so much for hosting us here today. Um, we have three amazing panelists as ever. Uh, firstly, we have Sarah Tulip, who is the Chief Operations Officer for AQL. Sarah Tulip is the award-winning COOO. COOO. -O -O -O. <laughs> um, she is a key voice in the Northern Powerhouse and a passionate champion of women in business and tech. Let's, ne let's get on to Stuart Clark. Stuart is the co-founder of a successful marketing consultancy and is an advisor and non-executive director of a number of startups. He is the co-founder and festival director of the Leeds Digital Festival. <laughs> You can tell we are giving a lot of love to the festival today and has overseen the growth from 56 events in 2016 to 170 in 2018. He's plenty of experience of the Northern Power Women. <laughs> Hello. Um, <laughs> being the little brother of six sisters. And finally, but not last, Annie Moscrate, the co-founder of She Does Digital, a group set up to highlight female role models so close to the Northern Power Women Hearts role models, and encourage more women into the sector. She has worked in digital marketing for the past 10 years and is currently head of planning at Epiphany, working in the award-winning creative studio. Welcome to all our panelists. <laughs> right, first question. A recent report claims robots will take 800 million human jobs by 2030 from retail and distribution to building industry and medicine. And there's no slowdown in this trend. How do we adapt our workforces and workplaces to plan for this future? And should we be concerned? Stuart, you've created a festival about this. Tell us, should we be concerned? Uh, well, I'd say uh, no, because hopefully the robots will do some of the uh, jobs, uh, uh, perhaps more tedious jobs, perhaps more repetitive jobs, and allow people to to develop more creative uh, thinking and more creative jobs. For example, when you look at Amazon with the warehouses, do you want people up and down the, the aisles or do you get robots to do that? And then, you know, let's create some more interesting jobs. And why do you have to work 35 hours a week? Why aren't we working three days a week, four days a week, that sort of thing? Oh, I like that, Stuart. Oh, I, I love that. <laughs> That's, I've been trying to do that for, for, for a long time. Uh, and, you know, and so hopefully we can use all this, these, these advances to, so I don't think it's replacing 800 million jobs. I think the challenge for us all is to, is to create 800 million extra different interesting creating jobs. I think that's a real challenge. Thanks Stuart. Sarah, should we be concerned? So um, I think we are on the cusp of like the second industrial revolution. So basically the, the whole workforce is going to change. So um, I have a little boy who's six years old um, and the job he probably does um, when he grows up doesn't exist right now the whole world is about to change um, so robots probably will take jobs cars will drive themselves the whole world is you know, we're on that cusp of this amazing thing that's about to happen and I completely agree with Stuart that we're going to do fun and interesting things um, so people are going to think in different ways people are going to operate in different ways um, even to the point that like my son learns to handwrite he's never probably going to write you know do handwrite it, the whole world is about to change so I think we're on the cusp of something very exciting and um, I think the big key thing to think about is actually looking at young people in education and people also um at work at the moment there are going to be massive redundancies and changes in the way that people work so my thoughts are more around okay we need to re-educate our workforce um, if you think that uh, in Leeds Asda let 10% of their workforce go because they were using robots and that's going to happen and it's like how do we retrain those people um, and make our workforce more suitable for the future so your son is going to have a job description titled fun and exciting, I think. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, definitely. But I think the way our brains will work, the way we operate, um, everything's going to be different. And I think it's, it's about embracing it and thinking about, you know, thinking about the future. Thanks, Sarah. Annie, she does digital. Should we be concerned? Um, I'm not particularly concerned at the moment, but I do think there might be an opportunity for women who go away to have kids and want a part-time job when they go back to the workforce because I think it's quite difficult to get a part-time job that you love in that situation. So if we work together with robots, perhaps you need the human touch to make sure things are going well and that could create some really good jobs for, for mums. And I think that's what you talked about, uh, career returners. I think I remember speaking on a panel last year at the Digital Festival about, you know, could career returners be the answer to our digital gap? You know, we talk about a uh, skills gap but are we going to have a skills gap in relation to, if we're going to have robots that come in, 
are we then going to have, we need new jobs, like your son is going to do this job that could be fixing those robots. So there could be a, could that be an opportunity, do you think? Could your, is your son going to be the robot fixer? Well, he wants to be a footballer, so I'm not quite entirely sure. <laughs> uh, but, you know, not many people get there. But I think, um, yeah, the, the jobs that are going to happen um, don't exist. And every day, I think, like, if I look at people who are coming through now, and you'll know in, in your industry, Annie, that there are jobs that I don't understand completely. Like, some of my friends are like, I do this, and I work within this social media, or I make people go to that. And that you know, that's slightly out of my realm. So I think that new jobs are coming through pretty much every day at the moment, and... Um, yeah, I guess so. he might be the robot fixer, but I hopefully he'll be the footballer. Just, just to show our hands in the audience, who is concerned? Who's concerned about AI robots? A low, a low number. A low, I know we are at the Leeds Digital Festival here, but you know. So um, yeah, any, any, any thoughts from the audience? Any? Oh, hold on, I'm, co I'm coming your way. Let me come with my microphone and awkwardly hover. Yeah, I think the. The influx of automation that is undoubtedly going to happen in a whole range of areas and careers and low skill to high skill may not hit sort of creative thinking industries straight away. But I think a lot of other areas or the knock on areas will be affected. And if we're thinking about that as a local marketplace, that's one thing. But as soon as you start thinking about it as a global marketplace, that's got a whole different spin on it, you know, and you have to really keep up with that. So I, I work actually in a non digital area that needs to be up to speed in digital, which is widening participation. So universities and colleges. And actually, those young people that we work with being able to access this fast moving information and upskill themselves isn't necessarily there, mm. isn't necessarily there for them in their school. You know, we're, we're talking about everybody need to be working at the same speed at the same time with the same information. And I don't think it's there across everywhere. So it may not affect sort of core industries or, you know, businesses yet but actually if we're thinking about your your son at six mine's five and goodness knows what he's going to be it's transformer at the moment <laughs> um you know but actually what job will he be doing i'm not sure um and it might be actually that we're moving towards and i've forgotten who wrote the article about actually we don't need everybody to work we need a few people to work but we need everybody to be able to survive and exist and actually those areas might be where we're moving towards so actually your work is your hobby because we're not going out to work in the same traditional way but how you finance that or how you trust governments to finance that is a, is a different a whole new kettle of fish that is a whole other question i think there isn't it 100 percent, stuart i'm coming to you well, just on that point, and that's a really important point because, you know, there's, there's issues around universal wage. Wealth is becoming increasingly uh, 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 increasingly owned by very few people, uh, particularly through sort of the tech and digital side. So we really have to think about how we distribute that wealth in, a, in, a, in an equal way because if this 800 million people are displaced and we're not giving them something to do, you know, that, that's going to be a real problem for, for societies all around the world. So, you know, we need to address those uh, economic issues. Brilliant, great question to start. And as ever with the Northern Power Women podcast, this is all about starting a conversation. So if you would like to get involved or have anything to share, please do get involved. Con connect at northernpowerwomen.com or at North Power on Twitter. Um, in our first question, we talked about working three days a week. And uh, leads us on to our second question. Is it time for business to take wellness more seriously? Um, it used to be that work was a place for working and home was a place to relax and unwind. We've just talked about work and life and life and work. But looking at stats, last year in the UK, 11.3 million days of work were lost due to stress, depression or anxiety. That's an average of 23 days per person. That is 10% of the working year. Does the workplace need to play a more active role in the physical and ment mental wellness of staff? Sarah? Very much so. Um, I think I'm the worst. I, I really have to own it that I'm really bad about work-life balance. Um, it's something I'm really addressing at the moment um, because I've I've completely let work take over my life. And um, my little boy, again, I talk about my son all the time, but um, he said to me, um, you know, I wish you weren't always working. And you know when it's something impacts on you? And it really made me think about it. And so I downloaded some apps that start telling me, like, when I'm on my phone all the time and I'm, I'm trying to address that balance because I know um, that I, I do it badly. But I completely encourage like outside work do not check emails you know people really need to have that and I think um, if you're not balancing it 
um, and you're not encouraging it as a business, I don't think you're breeding very good habits. So um, although I'm very bad for it, I completely encourage that. Do not have your work emails on your phone unless you need it. Do not be thinking about work outside work. Enjoy your life. Be happy. Um, yeah. Wellness, more seriously. Being happy more. Annie. Yeah, this is something really close to my heart at the moment. Um, I'm actually on a sabbatical from work. Um, it's my first week of seven and I'm not doing anything in particular. I'm not going traveling. And a lot of people think that's a bit strange, but I've been working my backside off and I've been a bit like Sarah, like not really taking life work balance very seriously. I've been missing out on my family. I've been missing out on time with my husband and I'm just chilling and and I want to be an example because I've got a team and we all work really hard and they're, they're just as bad as me and I want them to see, look, taking time out of work isn't weakness, it's not failure, it's something that you should do for yourself. Um, so if your company offers a sabbatical, look into it. I would definitely recommend it. If You, you need to save up a few quid to be able to do it, but um, I think it's super important. I think businesses should encourage taking time out, definitely. And how is week one going? Is it, are you having to work hard at it? Work hard at being on sabbatical? Do you know what? It's come very easily. <laughs> yeah, it's been good. I, I have been naughty. I've checked my emails about four times, but I've deleted it permanently from my phone. So I'm taking the right steps. I'm, I'm being good and I'm going off on holiday next week. So I definitely won't be looking at emails then. Um, yeah. Send us a postcard, Annie. <laughs> Stuart, wellness. Uh, should we take it more seriously? Absolutely, absolutely. I think, uh, again, going back to the previous two answers, that work-life balance is, is crucial. And uh, I'm the same as say, my 12-year-old tells me off if I'm on the phone too too much. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's always tempting to check one more thing, check one more thing. So I'm trying to get into the habit of putting the phone away when, you know, when we're uh, out and about. But I, I think one, one thing that changed over the last 20 years, I think it's more, it's more open conversations about, about wellness, about stress, about anxiety and things. And, you know, going back 20 years ago, people would be proud of doing 70, 80, 90 hours a week. And, oh, look at me. I'm, look, look how hard I'm working. Well, well, actually, you're probably, probably not working hard if you're doing that, uh, that, that many hours. So, and I've seen particularly uh, uh, with, with with male friends of mine, probably had more conversations over the last couple of years about stress, about anxiety, and about health in general than than ever before. And, uh, yeah, and that, I think that's a great great thing. You've just got to build things into your life. You know, how do you switch off? When I had a proper job, I would do all my mm-hmm. uh, one-to-ones with my staff outside. We'd, we'd walk. And we were looking at the three offices I worked in. It was always near parks, so you could have that one hour where you just concentrate on on the person rather than the job. But you have to build that in. You have to force it. And you know, other managers in the in the office would sort of you know look down. You know, what, what, what the hell are you doing? Having a jolly, having a walk around the park. But it wasn't a jolly. It was really important to have that proper time out of the office. And I think it's that visibility of doing that. We've all been in, um, I'm, I'm guessing, in, uh, situations where we see that presenteeism. Got to be in before the boss, got to leave after the boss. So we're the one who gets the petted on the head or whatever. So, uh, you know, I think that seeing you just taking that step round the block, that's a brilliant, visible role model. Annie, you know, I think this is brilliant what you're doing. You said, you, you know, at the start in your bio, it's about female role models. You are one right there, so please, you stay off that phone. Interesting enough, actually, there is India's youngest billionaire, Vijay Sharma, the CEO of Paytm, uh, Paytm um, says happiness is at the core of every decision that he makes. And that is every personal decision, but actually, more importantly, every business decision. Um, what, what do we think about that? I'm coming to the audience. So I totally agree about wellness being a big business decision. Um, a lot of companies, especially in Leeds at the minute, are looking into a lot of mental health and well-being, and they're encouraging exercise on a lunchtime. They'll do group yoga sessions. They'll offer discounts at gyms. And although sometimes you know we all feel the pressure to get into work before the boss, you know, go out at lunchtime, you know, take that time for you and just getting out of the office, having an eye holiday, it does help get rid of the stress that you're feeling because you're not surrounded by your computer and you're not having your sandwich thinking oh, an email's just come through, I've got to answer it because you're totally removing yourself from that situation. I've never heard of an eye holiday before, I, I love the idea of that. Annie's on a full eye holiday thank you. Do you, do you feel the pressure of 
you, you know, being in before your boss? Or do you feel that's something that is waning? I feel that's uh, definitely waning. I think the issue is you feel like you have to leave after your boss more than get in before them. Um, but you've just got to put things into your evening. Like, personally, I'm a brownie leader, so on a Tuesday, I tell myself I have to leave at around 4.30 or else I can't do what I commit to do on an evening. And you've just got to put things into your life that forces you to leave work when you're supposed to, rather than staying late. Brilliant, thank you. I'm coming, coming back. Hi, um, I'm actually a workplace wellbeing consultant. So the company that I work for, they're promoting this wellbeing charter to help companies make those kind of decisions about what actually wellbeing encompasses. Because it used to be, from before it's more of like a reactive measure but really we need to think more proactively and prevent prevent mental health issues because for instance I think across sick notes one in three is to do with mental health and we can prevent all of that I think rather than thinking oh what I need to do about like I need to go outside and have a break companies need to enable that to happen for instance like we say in like having the option to have sabbaticals if you don't know who to approach and you're scared about approaching your manager how are you going to do that so the the charter that we're promoting is helping people really make sure that what your the the values that you hold as a company are really being communicated so that it builds into the culture of the company rather than people feel like they're fighting against the company fighting against the boss to um to to value their well-being because it's for their company as well it's not just for themselves and so that takes it away if it's built into the culture it's not just a tick box yeah. exercise so yeah. you're seeing a big growth in in demand for, for 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 you know companies really trying to shift this i think companies are recognizing that it's not it's not just a nice to have anymore because it used to be the case that oh we do it just because it improves uh, it reduces um absence uh, um improves retention but really recognizing that company the the generation that are coming into work now Rec- want that in their company they want to be valued they don't want to be seen as robots because the robots are coming we are different we provide a different type of work we provide a different type of thinking and that needs to be supported by well-being as a whole thank you so i think we all i, I want to be i want a happiness i want to i want to start leaning forward and making every decision based on happiness um so a final question how did it get to that so soon a new study by the Gina Davis Institute on Gender in Media reports that women who watch the X Files pursued more careers in STEM. <laughs> We're at the Leeds Digital Festival, when in Rome and all that. Annie, what do you think? Well, I've not heard that one before. That's an interesting one. Um, so, when I was younger, I wanted to be a filmmaker, and I was inspired by. Um, films that I watched when I was young like um, one that really stands out is a film from the 90s called Leon and it had a really strong character played by Natalie Portman, she was only like 12 in it but she was really cool and um, I really wanted to be a cinematographer which is the person responsible for everything visual on a film so I went to film school in Leeds um, and that, that a few films like that really inspired me and I guess um, a technical role in film can be classed as a STEM role mm-hmm. it's, it's a technician role but then I've randomly ended up in digital which is what happens um, so we on our blog for um, She Does Digital we've got loads of stories of um, how women got into the roles that they're in called Where Did You Start and I don't think there's one single woman who intended to work in digital or studied something related um, so yeah that's what in, inspired me to eventually get into the technical world Brilliant. Stuart was there a TV show, a film or a book that influenced your career choices? Uh, not many films or TV shows about marketing so it's a <laughs> lack of, but I, th- I think when I was about 10 years old my favourite programme was a six million dollar man and of course today's price is probably about 37 million dollars, it was all about Steve Austin an astronaut and he had bionic legs bionic arm, bionic eyes and it's like this is a future, we can all be like that Did, did you have the toy? Oh, yeah, and you could roll the sleeve back and see the bionic arm. <laughs> it, it was wonderful. And then, then after that, they had a bionic woman as well. She had the bionic legs, arm, and hearing. So she had the hearing, not oh, the eyes. Didn't, 
six, uh, Steve Austin had. Didn't he have a bionic eye? Yeah, he had the yeah. eyes, and uh, then Jamie Summers. I can remember these things. She had the, she had the uh, bionic <laughs> hearing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you'll have to you'll have to Google it later. <laughs> but it was fantastic. And again, I think part of that it was just all. It was. I mean, it's always cheesy cheesy plot lines, but a lot of it was about technology. How do you use technology to to help enhance? And it was fantastic. Loved it. So Stuart Clark, Steve Austin. <laughs> I wish you could see this now. But <laughs> uh, Sarah, was there a TV show, a book, a film? that influenced you and your career choice? Yeah, I think so. So, um, and it's really corny, by the way, but um, I, um, as a kid, I was really into tech. And so I had a Commodore 64 and I used to write little games and I always loved tech. It was a really big part of my life. And it was unusual, I think, because not many girls were. Um, I always like gamed and computed and, and but because I came from a small town, there wasn't really a world around it. And so I didn't actually think there was a job in it. No one ever said, you can do, there's a job there. Um, so I went into sales, I went into technical sales and I ran sales teams and I went on that journey. Um, and I ended up in recruitment and I was doing IT recruitment. I was always very close to technology, but I never was as close as I wanted to be. Um, and this is super cheesy, but I was I was on holiday and I read um, Lean In. Um, and I thought that my whole life had to be in that area and I thought this is what I have to do I have to run recruitment teams I have to manage I have to sell um, and it talked about careers and how people's careers are different and women's careers are very linear so you kind of have to be in that channel and it said like guys don't do that like they'll like go from here to there they'll do that and this and I just came back and I thought right I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to do something different and I'm just going to put myself out there and I'm going to sell myself completely differently. Um, and from that point, I completely switched um, how how I, I guess, sold myself and who I was going to be. So I came out and I was like, I'm going to run businesses. But just because I've run recruitment businesses doesn't mean I can't run other businesses. And I just made myself step out of that and stepped into um, running technology businesses. Brilliant. In the audience, who any favourite films, books or TV Heroes that have motivated any of you to make your career choices. Hello. I think it's less of a certain thing, but um, I've grown up in that YouTube generation where everyone, you know, the YouTube boom happened and all these people who were just sitting in their room talking about what they enjoyed made a huge career out of it. And I think that's when it sort of hit um, a lot of people my age that you can do whatever career you want to as long as you really put a lot of effort into it. And that's when um, myself and my friends started looking into different career paths that weren't mentioned at school. Um, so it was definitely seeing all these people doing really well at something that no one had educated them on. That's interesting, actually. We talk about role models and I, the question was around film and TV. And, and so we've gone from we've gone from Stuart talking about the six million dollar man to YouTube. There, there, there's a generation gap right there. <laughs> um, I was going to say, like, my little boy, he's like, he asked me the other day, I want to start podcasting. And I was like, you're six. And he was like, I want to do a channel. I want to talk about my football. Um, so already, you know, like, he's a completely different generation. And I was working with um, a head partnership, a fantastic organisation that worked with schools. And they were talking about how to engage. Um, and they, they were in this room and they were like, who are the who are their heroes and we were like we don't know who their heroes are they're on youtube like these people like they're engaging with people that we have absolutely no idea about um you know I, joe loves fm fm tv family and he like they, these people who play games they can play computer games together and um, i think the way that role models are, are shaped is completely changing they're not pop stars they're these people who talk to um people via YouTube and the internet. It's those different educators, isn't it? I, I can feel after this podcast there is going to be multi-googling of all the different types of people that we have listening from from your um, billion dollar, uh, six million dollar man to uh, our YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Where did that time go? Um, thank you all to all of our panellists. Please give them a round of applause. Thank you to uh, KPMG and for hosting us as part of this amazing Leeds Digital Festival. If you've got any questions that you would like us to discuss on the podcast, then please do get in touch. If you've got any questions for us on Ask the Hive, please send us a voice memo to WhatsApp and please leave us a review if you feel like it. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much again. Thank you to all of you in Leeds. See you next time. A tremendous thanks again to our panellists, to KPMG and the Leeds Digital Festival as well. And thanks again to the M62 for hosting me for what seemed like an entire decade of my life. OK, I'm over it.
Right. We would love to know any subjects that you'd like to hear discussed on our next panel. Indeed, if you'd like to host us, do get in touch, please. All the details you need, you can find by emailing podcast at northernpowerwomen.com. Thank you. Now, it's time to learn some more and hear some really great advice, actually, from someone who's made it big in their chosen field. And this month, it's a woman who has one heck of a story to tell about following your dreams, about making your ambitions happen, and above all, about remaining true to who you really are. It's the host of BBC Radio Leeds morning programme, Stephanie Hurst. And I asked Steph if she'd always known that radio is where she wanted to work. Oh yeah, yeah, it was it was clear as day from from being really young. Um, I, I knew that I wanted to to work on the radio. I got a radio when I was around six or seven. There was something about the radio that really connected with me. I, I, I instantly had a vision of what this this studio or something that a DJ was sitting in, and I, I tried to imagine it. It was it was yeah. I was in, I was just fixated by this this thing called the radio. Did you know how to get there? Um, <laughs> where I lived, it was I was we were still regarded as Barnsley, but it was we were just on the edge of Wakefield, so I could get Hallam Radio Hallam, and I could get Radio Air. So uh, I tried Hallam, and Hallam were I think a little bit more flash with their cash because they had uh, someone to answer the, the phones. So uh, you, you would ring the radio station up and you'd get through to a phone operative. Whereas at Radio Air, the DJ answered the phone. So I could always get through to the DJ at Radio Air. And I asked to go in and look round at Hallam and, and didn't really get any joy. I mean, bear in mind, I'm about nine or ten years old. Whereas Radio Air, they used to do, I know, they, Radio Air used to do these open days. Um, so they'd always celebrate their birthday with a big open day. And, and my dad would take me down and drive all the way to Leeds. And I, I met a couple of the DJs and then used to ring them constantly. And one day I just bugged this particular DJ, a guy called Paul Stead. And um, I asked him whether I could come in and sit in. And he said, yeah, come in next Sunday. And that was the longest wait of my life. I was about 10 years old and I it, it, the, whole, the whole week dragged because I knew next Sunday I was going into Radio Air. I'd never been in a radio studio before. And I got to go in and it was, um, it was, it was, I remember he let me um, put a record on the turntable and get it ready for broadcast. It's called queuing a record up <laughs> and it was Toy Boy, Sunita. <laughs> <laughs> I know, exactly. So, um, and I was just, yeah, I was, in, I was fixated by, by this, this, this radio studio. I was, yeah, wow. I was, that was it. I was hooked. And then I got the chance to go in and help out every week. So I think actually the, the, the dogged determination of, I want to work in radio. And I'm not stopping and I'm going to bug the living daylights out of these guys until they they let me in was was very much my ethos. <laughs> it's always been my ethos, really, I guess. So you had this sort of dogged determination, this 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 tenacity. But mm. did you also ask for help? Because quite often we don't know where to get where we're going to, but we don't ever ask for help. Did you ask for help? I um I, I tried my hardest um to, to get to know every single DJ on the lineup. I mean, I knew their names. I knew what they looked like, but I wanted to learn from them. And I, I was, I, I, I was regarded as a as a sad little geeky anorak, but I just wanted to learn. Sam, I, I was just so desperate to learn, and I was obsessed by the music. I was obsessed by the studio. I wanted to know how the studio worked, so I, I, I asked the DJs, "Can you teach me how to edit?" Which is these days they do it on computer, waveform editing. Whereas before it used to be on, on reel-to-reel tape where you physically had to cut the tape in half. I, 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 was, I, I was annoying, I think, Sam. I think, I, I, I think the DJs probably thought, oh, gosh, here they come again. <laughs> what do they want now? And, um, but I, the only way to learn is to ask questions, isn't it, really? And so many of us are afraid to ask those questions. Aren't yeah, we so are. So many of us actually, are afraid yeah. to be seen as annoying. Yeah, I think we are afraid to be to be seen as annoying. And the other thing, actually, um, for people that are just starting out in their career, and <laughs> it sounds silly, but some advice I was given when I was when I was really young is make tea for people, get really good at making cups of tea, and I did. And if it's a good cup of tea, they may want to speak to me, and I may get to know them and learn from them. So yeah, the tenacity was definitely there in my mind to be able to write. I need to learn from these people. These people are. Uh, the gold to me. 
your focus and your tenacity, I was going to ask whether you felt you sacrificed other things because of your focus and your tenacity on this on this thing that was radio and your determination to get there. My schoolwork definitely suffered. I fell off the edge of a cliff around 14 um, because I, I, then I got really obsessed about radio, like really badly. <laughs> When you made it and you got a show on the radio that was your show and it was your name above the door and it was you pressing the buttons and your voice coming out, what did that feel like? Oh, gosh, it was um, it was 1992 and I was 16 and I was doing the overnight show and um, I, I was in Radio Air, so I'd been in Radio Air from 12 years old. I'd watched all my heroes in these studios. I was in Studio Two, which um, James Whaler used to do the late night show. Did all his phoning shows from that from that room um, to sit in there on my own in the middle of the night doing the graveyard shift <laughs> was just uh, I, I've given, I've got goosebumps now thinking about it because oh, I it was I, it was incredible. It was the best feeling in the world. And do you know what? You you only kind of get that once that first time, don't you? And I, I'd love, mm-hmm. if I could bottle it, I, I just, oh, I'd love to bottle it. I really would have. Um, but then, then once I got that first show over and done with, then it was graft. I had to work. I had to learn even more how to become a broadcaster because I wasn't playing at being a DJ anymore. I was one. Did you make any big mistakes? Yeah, um... And I did, there was one, th- it's called a link when you do you, you talk between two songs. And I was doing one link and I talked about someone's estranged husband and said he strangled and immediately <laughs> wanted the world to just swallow me up um, when someone buzzed through and said, did you just say strangled? And do you know when you've broken something and your head goes really hot? It, it felt like that. Yeah, I, was, I was mortified. I think that's one of my first, first big gaffes that I did. Oh, and I took the radio station off the air as well for 10 minutes. But no one knows about that. I never told anybody. No one noticed. It was the middle of the night. <laughs> so, I yeah. mean, they're quite tiny mistakes. In the, they're, they're quite tiny mistakes in the great scheme of things. I know they feel massive, especially when you're younger. But quite often we, we make decisions in our career that turn out to be the wrong decisions. And the best that, thing that we can do is to think, well, I've learned from that experience. Did you mm. ever go down the wrong road? I was very, um, I was very well advised. I I made sure that I, I uh, got to know the right people. Um, I worked out who was powerful in the radio station, who was respected, and um, I, I always used to ask for advice. So throughout my career, there's been some real key people who I've always gone to for advice, probably because of their track record. Um, have I made any? big mistakes there's nothing that really stands out um i've sworn on the air by accident at 10 past eight an f came out an f in l actually came out at 10 past eight uh because i'm so relaxed i'm so um i'm i'm really at home behind this this thing the microphone i can tell it anything and i'd actually forgotten i was on the radio this is about 10 years ago and i've never done it since touch wood i never do it again but i was so relaxed i was having a conversation and it, I'd, I'd just said but yeah but effing hell and then everyone around me just their, their faces just dropped and i i went have i just have i just sworn and in unison everyone went yeah and then i thought well what can i do here and your brain goes into overdrive, doesn't it? And I just thought, right, what do I do? I said, do you know what? I'm really sorry. I, I, I forgotten I'm on the radio. I've actually, I'm so relaxed behind this microphone. I've actually forgotten I've, 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 I've I'm on the air. I'm really sorry. And if you're offended uh, from the bottom of my heart, I, I am so sorry. I've wanted to do this job since I was 60, since I was six years old. I've been on since I was 16. It's never happened. It'll never happen again. I'm sorry. And I never got one complaint at all amazing so I just pray to God that it never happens again uh, and I think actually I'm on my guard now actually I think I have my nan button firmly pushed in because you never swore in front of your nan did you <laughs> that's always never a did. really good thing you never did people will say to me how how do you not swear on the radio I go imagine your nana sat there exactly it's not, it's exactly. not just gonna pop out it's not it's gonna not, happen it's not so yeah it's very firmly pressed in that button now it's on permanently for the rest of time <laughs> I need to talk, Steph, about the time when everything changed, not just in your career, 
but of course in your life because you had worked tirelessly to get to an incredibly high point in your career. And that was where you were presenting, you know, a regional breakfast show. You were doing a national chart show. And yet you had to take the decision to walk away from the career that you had spent more than 30 years fighting towards. And that's because you you had to be true to yourself, I suppose. If people aren't aware of your journey, can you explain? So I knew... Um... I knew two things from a real early age. One, which we've just been talking about, which was that I knew I wanted to work on the radio. That's very clear as day to me. Another thing I also had complete clarity on was that I wasn't a boy and uh, I was born with genitalia that that said I was a boy, so I came out looking like one. Uh, but unfortunately, we can't see when uh, when we're pregnant, uh, you know, with scans and everything. How many scans anyone that's pregnant has just to make sure that baby's growing okay and everything is fine and double checking and just making sure it's it's cooking properly. But you can't see how the brain is growing uh, and how that child uh, or that person will identify with their gender. And um, because there was no Google, uh, my parents couldn't look this up. From an early age, I'd, I'd say things like, I'm not a boy, I'm a girl. Um, those, those, that was the only way I could vocalise it. But parenting in the in the 80s was, was very different. You, you know, you just got a clip around the year old and you got told to man up and get out and play with your mates on your bike, which is, is, is what I did. Or I went upstairs into my, into my bedroom and played my records. Um, so I, 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 I battled with this gender identity issue from, from childhood. My earliest memories are, are, are being in a classroom at school when all the boys are put together in, in infants and all the girls are put together. A gold door handle, a green door. All the girls sat next to the door and I was next to the windows where there were some lots of big straw bricks and I was with all the boys. And I distinctly remember looking over at the girls thinking I shouldn't be here with the boys. I need to be I need to be in the girls group. But almost frozen, I, I, I couldn't move. And and it's interesting, isn't it, how I think society is it, we, we almost become like robots, don't we, in some respects? Mm. I just I knew that I I I I, I know I can't be a girl. I know I am a girl. I can't. I, it really starts to to mess with your mind. And then you have the onset of, of, of puberty and the body changing. And, and this, I'm, I'm looking at this thing that I've got. I'm, no, this is wrong. And all the girls at school are starting to develop. And I'm going, why isn't this happening to me? And it was just a, a real um, it's complex issue in my mind because gender identity and and what then becomes gender dysphoria um, isn't a mental illness. It becomes one because of the mental anguish that I was constantly going through. So I just threw myself into into music. I threw myself into 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 radio. I, that is why I obsessed about it because it made it go away. It was the one thing that made me stop thinking about it. I did go to my GP when I was 17. And at this point, I've just really started getting somewhere in my career. I, I started doing that, the overnight shows and stuff at Radio Air. Everything, you know, all the hard work that I put in from being 12 years old and, and the graft and the making tea, um, did, you know, the stuff that, that should have been happening did happen and, you know, it's coming to fruition. Uh, and I went to my GP and told him that I was having real, real trouble with how I felt. I, I didn't feel like a, we didn't use the word gender. We used sex back then. And uh, yeah. it's in the early 90s. And I remember saying, I feel like my sex is wrong. Uh, I don't, I'm not a boy. I have felt like this all my life. I need some help. And I distinctly remember him saying to me that um, I strongly recommend you do not take this path in life. You will lose your friends, your family. And he, he said something like you were strapping young lad or something like that. And I wasn't. I mean, I'm only five foot seven. I was I was always a tiny little, you know, skinny thing. And um, yeah, that that put the fear of God up me. So I think I just buried it under the carpet. The thing is, though, as you said, you had worked tirelessly year in, year out for more than three decades to get to a incredibly, you know, the the highest echelons of your career. And the thing is, Steph, your whole career was built around you. 
it, it's not like you were a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer who had transferable skills and it didn't really matter how you presented. But when you were presenting as Simon, you couldn't really then the next day turn up and go, hello, I'm actually Steph and I've always been Steph because your whole career had been built around another identity, another area on identity. So did you feel you had to lose Every, you had to lose the whole radio thing for at least a while. Yeah, I um, I, I'd got to the top of, I suppose, really in the world of commercial radio. Um, I probably had the biggest gig, really. I always used to look at, at, at you did, yeah, at Doctor Fox um, years ago when he used to do the chart, Neil Fox, and uh, <laughs> he was doing he was doing Drive on Capital, one of the biggest gigs in the country. And also doing the chart. And I, I remember thinking years ago, I'm thinking, that is just what a gig, what a gig. And then I ended up doing the biggest breakfast show outside London, which is which was Galaxy Breakfast Show in Yorkshire. And uh, I ended up with the chart. I'm like, so I, I'm torn. I'm, I'm, and at this point, I'm in, a, I'm in real dire straits with my, my gender because it's not going away. And I'm at a point where I'm going... If I felt like this at, at, at six years old and at 16 and at 26 and at, in my 30s, I, it's going to be there at, at, you know, at 46, 56 and 60s. It's going to be there my entire life. And I've got these these this great big gig. I'm doing the biggest breakfast show outside London. I'm doing the national chart show. I've got, you know, a flat in London, uh, the house in Yorkshire. I'm split across the country. So I tried to bury them as, as much as I could and then got to a point where I had to do something about it. It was it was very much, and it's very blunt when I say this, but it was very much, I'd got to a point where I was going to kill myself. There was no other way out because I'd, I'd seen the way that trans people were portrayed. You know, it was like you were, they were hated because people just could not get their head around it. And the thing is, you're not meant to understand it because you, you don't know what it feels like to, to, to be, your gender be wrong. You have no, if you've got, and I've said this before many times, if you've got chronic back pain, I don't know how that feels, but I can empathise with you and I can, I can try and understand and try and help you uh, and accept the fact that you've got this chronic back pain. Um, not that I'm comparing that to, to being trans, but, you know. So, yeah, it, it was it was really tough. And I, I, I would see the daily newspapers, how trans people were portrayed and people, you know, spoke about on TV, sex change, Charlie, gender bending freak. You know, it was always a story about a trans person who had a really successful life and then had nothing and was never going to get anything again. And all these things were around me and it just made me feel like, well, this is going to happen to me. So I can't bear losing my career. I can't bear. I couldn't imagine not being on the radio. So it, it was, death was the only option. And um, I, 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 I decided one day, it was a really sunny day. I may have said this to you before, Sam, that it was a gorgeous day. The windows were open. It was a really sunny day. And I decided that why should I die? Why should I take my own life? for the fear of being ostracized why should i why should i die just because someone may not get this and i decided that no i deserve to live i i am a, a living breathing healthy human being i've got everything to live for and, and I, I and i would see i would watch other people's transition videos on youtube around the world because the, the internet can be blamed for a lot of things in the world we live in today but actually it's brought us a lot of good and it's connected people um to, to allow them to feel less alone, I guess, really. That gave me a lot of strength to make me think that I can do this. So I decided that I need to stop my job. I need to quit my job. So I stopped and I took some I took some time out from from doing radio. I had about, had about a year and a half off, something like that. Um, but the, the way that I wasn't going to announce it publicly, I was just going to disappear. But um, my boss who was my boss at Galaxy was was now working in Australia and we'd had some real late night Skype conversations. And he did say to me that um, you could save a life, not lives, you could save a life if you went public, if you told your story. And that played in my mind for a few days and I, I really thought long and hard about it and I thought about all those YouTube videos that I'd seen and those vlogs and how those people had inspired me to to find the strength and courage to, to be able to make this journey. And I decided that 
I was going to go public. So uh, went away for a bit, went to, went to LA as you do, chilled out there for a little bit with my friend Chris, who also did a breakfast show and he was off at the same time. So we just chilled out in LA for a little bit, got back. And um, then uh, Chris had a, a friend who he'd worked with at, at Radio 1 and um, she was now working in the world of PR and we, we spoke together and um, she said, well, she'd like to PR this and, and manage it for me. And I think trying to manage it myself and transitioning publicly was too much to juggle. And she 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 got me a spot on Five Live. She got me an interview with the incredible Stephen Nolan, who's one of my favourite broadcasters. So I, 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 I went to Media City um, on the Thursday. This The interview transmitted on the Saturday, recorded it on the Thursday. And um, I think... Uh, my life changed in that studio. Uh, I'd never met Stephen before. We talked for about 49 minutes and on the Saturday they transmitted 49 minutes. They didn't edit it at all. But when I said the words to Stephen during the interview, um, and I didn't know what point I was going to say it, but when I said that I'm transgender, something changed. My whole world became in colour. I'd always struggled with clarity. I felt like, do you know when you're... You're a little disjointed from reality. You're a little bit hungover. You, you know, everything feels a bit hazy. Mm. I always felt like that. I always felt a little bit out of kilter. I felt like I was square peg round all, just a little bit of things just didn't fit right. And I just put it down to, oh, that's just the way I feel. But actually, when I said the words, it went away. I, I can't explain it. Something happened in that studio. I cannot tell. I don't know what it was, but maybe it just... Those those years of anguish and pain and mental torment and every it's like when you've told her if you we all tell we've all told a lie in our lives. I I, I make a, a I make a, a real point of of never lying, but we've all had to tell the occasional lie and sometimes the lies have got out of hand and it, it consumes you. It, it, it every waking moment it's on your mind. It's there when you go to sleep. It's there when you wake up. That's what it feels like in some respects. That's an element of what it feels like to be to, to be in the wrong body, your gender be wrong. And it, it just it would not go away. And I think because once I'd said it, and I said there was other people at the other side of the glass who I'd never met before, and I'd said it into a microphone in front of Steve, and this thing was going out on the air in a couple of days. I wasn't going to stop it. Things changed. And my world became in colour, and it, it's been the most incredible journey. I feel... I feel blessed and lucky to have had the career that I've had and also incredibly fortunate to still have it. What advice would you give, Steph, for someone who believes they're not being true to themselves and whatever their career is and whatever that means to them, if someone believes they're not being true to themselves, what advice do you give about finding that strength to say, do you know what, I might have to give that up but to be true to myself, this is what I need to do. What advice do you give? Um, you you need to follow your dreams. And, and there's cliches here, isn't it? Life's too short. You've got to follow your dreams. And I, I think they've been said so much that we hear them and they, they it's like they go in one ear and out of the other a little bit, don't they? But you do, if, if you feel that... You are not. You're not being who you truly, truly are. You're you're stuck in a nine to five. You're you're working for someone you you do not like. Never work for anybody you don't like. If you don't like that person, why are you spending your your day in front of that person? Um, get another job. It sounds really easy, doesn't it? It's not always as simple as just getting another job, but but get on the pathway to finding a new job. Maybe the career path that you've taken in life is not the one that you really actually wanted. So you you always knew that you wanted a certain profession, but maybe you think it, you think it's too late. It's never too late. People retrain all over the world. All the time. There are so many incredible, you know, TED Talks or whatever. There's so many incredible talks and, and people online you can watch that you can get inspiration from. But my advice would be if you feel like you're you're not being your true self, you have to do something about it because you will live to regret this. I could not. I've, I, well, I wouldn't be here. I would have killed myself. Clear as day. Abs I would not be here today saying these words at all because I had to be true to myself. I could not live another 40, 50 years. 
So you could end up wasting your life and other people's lives by just being miserable because you're not being true to yourselves. We, we, we need to find true happiness. Life is, 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 and here's that cliche again, life's too short. It really is. Really inspiring stuff from Steph. A big thank you to her for taking part. And of course, you can hear her weekday mornings from nine o'clock on BBC Radio Leeds. Who would you love to hear interviewed in this part of the podcast? Any ideas, big or small, whoever it may be, you'd love to know more about what makes them tick. Do get in touch. Email podcast at northernpowerwomen.com. OK, time now for Ask the Hive. And the first time a man has got in touch for some advice. Great stuff. This month's question comes from Ryan. I graduated in August 2017. It's now May. I really want to work in the construction design industry and I can't seem to get onto a graduate scheme. I have emailed people, apply for jobs and even apply for work experience, but to no success. Can anyone give me some advice on how to get into a graduate scheme? So if you're not getting any positions, I think the best thing you can do is just keep volunteering or doing internships or just getting involved at events because that really aids your network and you know your name's actually going out there. And people, if someone's at an event and you're at it, you might have done a talk or a workshop, they'll remember that at the interview and I think, OK, they're active in the community, they definitely want to give back. Um, but always keep applying for jobs. Even if you get a verbal acceptance from someone, don't take that as final. Just keep applying until you get written. Looking for a job is really, really hard and it's nothing... That, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything that you're doing wrong. It is really hard to get into. I think the things to keep doing is just focus on what you enjoy doing because your passion will show, your confidence will show, making connections with people that you enjoy working with. Um, I guess with design, it's building that portfolio and yeah, you might not get paid immediately up front, but down the line, people will see the things that you've done. So really just focusing on what you enjoy and keep at it. Um, start planting the seeds and things will grow eventually. I, I think uh, one of the key, key areas uh, to get into work is just uh, volunteering for uh, events, volunteering for networking, uh, just getting involved in what's going on in your, your local city. There's always plenty of meetups, plenty of networking events, get in there, network, meet the right people. People are always really generous with their time, really generous with connections, uh, and I think if you put yourself out there, get in front of people and you'll find that it's really it's, it's not easy because you've got to put the effort in but you know it'll make it easier to to find the right opportunities and the, and the right connections and it's it's just all about putting the as you always say you know 80 percent of success is showing up go to everything you can the relevant things and just really you know make people aware of what you want be upfront about it and it's easier then for people to help you well, i think you have to keep motivated Build your confidence and try to improve every day your CV, your interview skills. Talk to people in the same situation. Ask them about the experience. It's what I've been doing lately. So every day I look at my CV to go, I should improve that. I should make it better and, uh, and socialize, build a network. And it's what I've been doing. So the first thing I'd recommend is go to meetups. There's loads of them around. These are brilliant for networking. You get to meet experts um, talking about interesting new tech in the field. And you can see what new innovations are coming along. You can and you quite often find out about jobs and get to just get to meet people, the people that are hiring. More generally, just find out the names of the bosses, the CEOs. Try sending them messages on Twitter or whatever. And then even like often to, to buy them a coffee, I'll ask if you can pick their brains. These are the sort of things, just get yourself known, get yourself out there and get people to know who you are. And I'm sure sooner rather than later, you'll be able to find something. Um, so I think you should apply for as many things as possible and not self-exclude because of your experience or because you don't um, feel you meet all the criteria. I think sometimes um, graduate schemes can say, you know, quite scary. They might talk about things that you're not aware of, that you've never done before. Um, and I think, you know, try go for things that are interested about the company and the values. 
A big thank you if you took time to offer your advice this month. And Ryan, please do let us know how you get on. Now to this month's question, and it's one so many of us have had to face at some point in our lives. Imposter syndrome. So I started in the tech industry at 17 and I really struggled um, on like feeling like I fit in there even after all the aptitude tests and actually getting the job, seeing everyone's skill around me, I didn't feel like I was worthy. Like, how do I go over this? So as you heard there, she's passed the test, she's got the job, but still doesn't, in her own words, feel worthy of being there. Can you help? What practical advice can you offer? Have you been there? How did you get over it? We'd really love to hear from you, so please get in touch. You can either record a voice memo on your phone and email it to podcast at northernpowerwomen.com and you can open up WhatsApp on your phone as well at the Northern Power Women podcast on 07928 387 712. That's 079 28 387 712. Just add us and then if you hold down the little microphone icon in your message window, speak and let that button go, your message will come straight to us. And if you need those details again, you can find them online at northernpowerwomen.com. So there you go for another month of great stories, advice and ideas, a full 12 episodes of the Northern Power Women podcast. Huge thank you for listening. Please do tell everyone you know who might be interested because, of course, together we are stronger. And save the date. The next episode arrives on Wednesday, the 3rd of July. Or does it? Mm -hmm. Make sure you subscribe right now, please, wherever you get your podcast from, so you don't miss any little surprises. Until then, this is the Northern Power Women podcast. I'm Sam Walker, and this has been a What Goes On media production for Northern Power Women. (laughs) 